On the 11th of November 1941, the HMA Sydney left Victoria Quay Fremantle and headed north up the Western Australia coast to escort the troop ship Zealandia for some of its journey to Singapore. On the 13th of September, Sydney was relieved by the HMS Durban in the Sunda Strait and began its journey back to Fremantle. Sydney was supposed to be back at Fremantle on the 20th of November and when there was no sign of her on the 23rd of November, the naval board signalled her, but there was no reply. According to the German Fregatten Kapitän Theodor Anton Detmers, with information that was forced out of him, the details of the battle between HMAS Sydney and HSK Cormoran were revealed. At 1700 hours on the 19th of November 1941, when Sydney was 120 nautical miles west of Shark Bay, Western Australia, Sydney spotted the Dutch merchant ship Stratmalaka and signalled it. Sydney signalled Stratmalaka continuously with her signal lamp as Sydney got closer and closer to the Stratmalaka. Merchant ships were known to be slow at signalling back at that time. The Germans exposed this knowledge. At 1800 hours, the Cormoran broadcast a QQQQ suspicious ship message a false cry for help in the name of Stratmalaka to further the deception. Sydney drew in closer with her main armament and torpedo tubes bearing with its aircraft on the catapult engine running. 1815 hours, Sydney had shut her aircraft down and approached almost a beam of Cormoran to starboard with less than a mile's distance. The two ships steered west-southwest at about 14 knots. Sydney signalled with flags and flashing lights asking, We're bound. To that, the Cormoran replied, Batavia. The vital moment came when Sydney hoisted a two-flag signal that had the letters IK, the two middle letters of Stratmalaka's four-letter secret identification signal. The Germans couldn't decipher the signal, so Sydney signalled in plain language the question, show your secret sign. Theodore Anton Detmers could no longer hide the true identity of his ship. With the power of surprise, Detmers ordered the Dutch colours to be removed and hoisted the German naval ensign and began to fire with all armament at 18.30 hours. It's feasible that the Cormoran's first fire destroyed Sydney's bridge, which put her central gun control out of action. Sydney's guns opened fire almost simultaneously, passing above the Cormoran without causing any damage. According to the German survivors, all the Cormoran's arm armament was aimed at Sydney, focusing on her bridge, torpedo troops and aircraft batteries. With a second round of fire, Sydney hit Cormoran's funnel and engine room. At the same time, more artillery went over the ship. The Cormoran fired two torpedoes, one struck under Sydney's turrets and the other passed close ahead of the ship. On a last try, Sydney veered towards Cormoran, as if trying to ram. As she did that, the top of one turret was blown off and overboard. Sydney then passed under Cormoran's stem, heading southward and losing her way. By now, the Cormoran was on fire and smoke was affecting visibility. While Sydney went southward, the distance between both ships increased. The Cormoran continued to fire. At around 18.45 hours, Sydney fired what was thought to be four torpedoes. They all missed the Cormoran because the captain turned the ship to port. Simultaneously, the Cormoran's engines began to break down and then stopped running completely. Sydney mangled and on fire steamed slowly south, returning scattered fire, while still receiving regular hits from the Cormoran. At 1900 hours, the Cormoran fired one single torpedo. The torpedo missed Sydney's stern. Cormoran's last shot was fired at around 1925 hours from 11,000 yards away. With the darkness after dusk imminent, the Sydney disappeared into the distance and was last seen by the Germans about 10 miles away. Up until 2300 hours, all that was seen was a distant glare and after that, they could only see a flicker of light every now and again until midnight. After midnight, the Sydney had vanished. Aboard the HMAS Sydney were 645 men. Of that 645 men, 42 of them were officers and 603 were ratings. There were no survivors. The only debris recovered at that time were an Australian naval type Carly life float eight days after the battle. There was also an Australian naval pattern life belt. The Cormoran's captain ordered an abandonment between 2000 hours and 2100 hours. 
The fire delayed the launch of lifeboats. The last boat cast off at midnight. One large rubber boat sank and 40 men drowned. There were 380 men aboard the Cormoran and 318 survived. At 0030 hours, the mines carried by the ship exploded and the Cormoran sank. In February 1942, a Kali float drifted to Christmas Island and was taken ashore. There was a deceased sailor aboard it. He was dressed in a boiler suit. He was the unknown sailor. He was buried with full military honours. In 1949, there was an investigation into him and it was concluded that he wasn't from the HMAS Sydney. After rediscovering and examining his grave, modern forensics proved this conclusion wrong. DNA samples collected in 2006 were extensively tested for 15 years. This led to us being able to find out who the unknown sailor was. He was able seaman Thomas Wellsby Clark from New Farm in Brisbane. It is believed that he was the only sailor to make it to a life raft after the ship sank. My question was why the HMAS Sydney went towards the HSK Cormoran, if it just looked like a Dutch merchant ship. Now I know why. It was because the HMAS Sydney signalled the HSK Cormoran, as they would with any passing ship. They waited for the HSK Cormoran to reply, and when they did, Sydney asked, We're bound, and Cormoran replied, Batavia. Then Sydney put two flags up that had IK, the middle two letters of the secret identification word. The Cormoran did not know what this was, and even when Sydney asked, Show your secret sign, the Cormoran still did not know what to reply with, and therefore knew the jig was up. Then the HMAS Sydney went closer, and shortly after, the battle began.